Thank you for joining me, Lindsay. Thank you for having me here, Tasha. So you and I are friends. We've known each other for about uh, probably about nine months now. Does that sound about right? Nine or ten months? Yeah. 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 So um, it's been really lovely getting to know you, and you know the times that we've connected have been really wonderful and very special to me. And it also um, occurs to me in this moment that I actually don't know you so well. You know, there's a <laughs> lot about your your life that I don't know about, and so I'm excited for this conversation to learn more about you and some of the uh, things that you do. And um, maybe you could start by just telling me a little bit about who you are and, you know, how, how you've come to be in this conversation over, <laughs> you know, over the course of your life, what, what's, a, what's transpired and, and who are you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So who am I? Okay. I am currently here in Woodstock, New York, where I live. I've been here just like five and a half years now. Um, so I guess the way that I, I maybe just want to create a structure for talking about my life is through talking about where I've lived, <laughs> because mm, wonderful each place has... You know, provided its own teachings, its own medicine, and uh, shaped me in a particular way. So, I was born in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, my my dad is Australian, my mom's American, and um, I lived there for the first seven and a half years of my life, and then moved to Santa Barbara, California, one. Yeah, when I was seven and lived there until I was about 19. So Santa Barbara is really home, it's hometown. Um, and from there, um, I moved to New York when I was 19. So I've been in New York for 11 years now between the city and uh, the Catskills. So I guess in terms of biography what brought me here having this conversation with you is probably a series of faded events coincidences who knows what they were but um, you know it's I think it's important to speak to the fact that we met at the monastic academy and um, the reason that I was at the monastic academy was because I had been embarking down a, a path of Zen and tea for a couple of years and found myself last year under lockdown with a lot of time and space to go deeper into practice than I had gone before. And what ended up happening as a result of that was uh, a few months into living a sort of hermit life, I realized that my orientation toward my life had changed significantly, even to a point that kind of scared me. And I immediately was seeking community, guidance, support around that pivot. And this was June of last year, and it felt like the worst possible timing because the ways in which I thought those needs could get met specifically through being in a training environment didn't feel possible. Most of the spiritual training centers and centers, monasteries I knew of were pretty much closed to the public. Um, the only place that I found that would take me in was the monastic academy at that time. And so um, yeah, I had the opportunity to go there last summer and through that, um, I think we met on my second trip there. That's right. In September. Yeah, but um, I mean, in the, yeah, the, in the last year, my involvement with Maple has, has been a huge part of my life. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, what brought me to a Zen practice to begin with was year, years and years of trying to find 
a spiritual practice that really resonated with me, that felt sustainable. And at different times that took on different forms. So like the earliest spiritual practice I had was like back when I was in Australia, when I was seven, like my, my, my temple, my church was uh, like nature and specifically like fairies. And I would pray to them and leave them offerings and I would like see them flying around my room. It was, that was my connection to something bigger than myself and more mysterious than myself. And through that, you know, having that sense of, of home in the unknown was something I carried with me into moving to California where I was exposed to so many practices and paths and was able to have access to yoga and meditation even in my public elementary school as a kid so I just feel so grateful that those doors were open to me and yeah so it was really throughout my teens that um I guess my, my path became something that I knew was a priority, like the priority in my life. And at that time, it was taking on more of a yoga, a Hindu form. And, you know, I read Autobiography of a Yogi and <laughs> attended kirtans and uh, even had a, a guru who was living in the hills behind Santa Barbara I would go visit and study with. But my relationship to that path really changed when I was in my late teens and felt this this urge, this calling to um, to like find the authority and agency within myself rather than outside of myself. And the way that that happened was through um, more pagan pagan traditions, actually. So. Uh, I had a teacher who was a healer and knew about magic spells and knew about herbalism and energy healing. And she took me under her wing when I was 16, 17. And I studied with her in kind of a casual friend way for a few years and was working at her herb shop in Santa Barbara all through high school. And... Yeah, when I moved to New York City, that was still a part of me, but it, but I was like at art school, I had all these other things that I was interested in, kind of distracted by, but it ended up coming back when I left school, and for about five years living in Brooklyn, I, I had my own little magical practice and even found magical community. And we would host moon ceremonies together and pray together, commune in that way. But yeah, it my relationship to my path really shifted again when I was in my mid twenties, and I found tea. And tea is actually probably the number one reason why you and I are here today. And um, I think the reason why tea really resonated with me was because it brought all the focus to the immediate space around me. So like before my, my way of feeling sort of at home or connected was by really projecting out and closing my eyes, imagining myself traveling through space <laughs> um, or even like feeling this kind of greater sense of communion with nature, but but like there wasn't necessarily a sense of immediacy or even like a simplicity or plainness to that practice. And um, through tea, I began to appreciate the the extraordinary in the ordinary, and. Um, it was also it's also very tactile practice, very sensual practice, very uh, yeah, like I said, uh, immediate. And because of the particular tea tradition that I've been 
studying within. Um, tea is what led me to Zen, and Zen is what led me to to Maple. Hmm. So hmm. that's a sort of roundabout way of talking about it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a broad question. That's a that's a perfect answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd love to, of course, ask more about tea, but before I do that, can you, um, I, I'm curious, you've mentioned this to me before, but I'd be curious to ask more about why, when the pandemic hit, you, your response was to lean into solitary practice and making use of your space and situation to dive more into practice. I mean, to me that, um, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, but it's also somewhat unusual. And so I'd be curious to hear about your experience of that and what your motivations were and, and what that was like for you. Yeah. Um, it felt like the only possible strategy for moving through the lockdown in a way that honored my health <laughs> like it wasn't even it didn't even feel like a choice it was like okay I'm gonna be like in my apartment by myself potentially for months with no definite end in sight like I better practice I mean there was so much anxiety as I'm sure you remember so much anxiety in the air like the first couple of weeks I was you know doom scrolling and talking to as many people throughout the day as possible just trying to feel sane and at that time we thought it was going to be like a three-week lockdown like okay after three weeks we'll life will go back to normal but then it became clear that wasn't the case and then some fierce determination arose within me to just take like exquisite care of myself in any way possible throughout that time. Um, really, because I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, never been alone for that long. I was, I was also anxious and scared and sad, uh, disoriented, and I did like part of me knew that like an, one of the ways I could could have sort of coped would be to like almost like numb myself or like reach for the comfort blanket and try to you know like I was in the first few weeks like be on the phone all day or dive into a Netflix series, um, but. Actually, maybe even more comforting was was my practice in, in a deeper way. So mm -hmm. that's why I mm -hmm. decided to practice more. And I'm glad mm -hmm. I did. And it was in some ways terrible. <laughs> it's was, it was just like, uh, I mean, I described that last summer as like, it felt like a wildfire burned through my life. And I think this is also one of the... Um, one of the effects of being in the pandemic where like for so many people, their priorities changed or they got more clear on what they wanted from life. They had a wake up call that, you know, maybe the way that things had been wasn't necessary. It wasn't helpful. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was one of those. What did... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad it's a it's a precious opportunity that you had to do so much practice during that time, even though the circumstances were unexpected and challenging. Uh, uh, what, what did what did it look like? What did the retreat look like practically for you, uh, in terms of how you set your day up and your time? And I, I presume you still had to do some work and so on and things like that. Yeah. So. I had a pretty regular routine, which is also was kind of new for me. Um, but 
my routine was something like wake up earlier than I usually would, maybe like six o'clock, five thirty or six o'clock, and um, sit, do a little exercise, have breakfast, and have tea, and then do my thing throughout the day. At that time, I was actually starting a business, so I was working on my my coaching practice, which is called Wing Makers, as you know, and so I was doing a lot of work on that, and then would sit again in the evening. Um, like the having the the structure and the container of the routine, I think, was a big part of what was helpful for me. Um, and then there was a time when I was able to do a silent retreat as well. So I did just like an at home silent sit and sip <laughs> retreat that just involved a lot of meditation and tea throughout the day. And that was, mm-hmm. that was in May. That was a big turning point for me too, where after that I was like, I was in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for describing that, the practical side of it. That's really helpful. And I imagine it'll be, it's inspiring to me. So I imagine it'll be inspiring mm-hmm. to others as well. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk about tea. Um, um, maybe I'll just share as well what my own experience was a little bit, uh, just to preface for folks. Um, I I did a I attended a tea ceremony that was extremely informal in Taiwan, probably like seven or eight years ago, and um, really didn't know what to make of it. I was like. It was it was very much about the tea, and um, it was in a, a, a strange tea shop, and it was like a very modern form of tea ceremony in Taipei, uh, and it, w- it was all about the, the the literal tea, and like tasting the tea. It was it was like an aesthetic, like mm, not exactly, but like culinary type experience. You know that was the emphasis, and um, it, and then at a certain point, I became aware that before I met you that, that tea was a a spiritual practice. And, um, that was something I hadn't been aware of. And then when I returned to Maple, you know, I had been going back and forth between the Vermont and California locations. When I returned to the Vermont location, uh, I had a friend that I was training with that was like, there's, there's this person, Lindsay, and she's wonderful. And she does tea ceremonies and you have to do a tea ceremony with her. <laughs> and I was like, I do, I do. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we've sat for several tea ceremonies together. It's, it's been a real blessing and, um, yeah, it, definitely a spiritual practice. And so I would love to hear from you. Um, and, and for those that may not know what, what is a tea ceremony and, and, what are what's what why why would it be a spiritual practice yeah so there are so many different kinds of tea ceremonies all around Mm -hmm. the world something that i love about tea is that it's been tea as a beverage and a practice has been adapted by so many different cultures Mm -hmm. um But the tea ceremony that I practice is uh, something that is kind of a a hybrid of sorts. It is a practice that kind of brings together some of the way of tea philosophy that you would find in a Japanese tea ceremony practice, a Chanoyu practice, with an appreciation and an enjoyment of Chinese teas. And even the the teapot that we use within this practice is a hybrid itself as well. It's it's kind of based off of a tea pot that would have been used in China you know, many, many centuries ago that they would have boiled the tea in and it has a side handle and the side handle is, is angled really high upright so that um, it's not super close to the flame, so it's still grabbable. But then also, the side handle pot was really popularized in Japan as well with the kyusu, which is more of a straight angled 
side handle pot. So this one is kind of in between. It's angled slightly upright, but um, the way that we enjoy and serve tea is um, with intention for connecting to ourselves on a deeper level, connecting to tea as a plant medicine and as a sort of messenger from the natural world and connecting to each other on a deeper level. So, you know, there are, there are four different brewing methods that I practice and not all of them um, are intended for the same thing. So like there's a, the practice I'm describing is what we call bowl tea. And it's really intended for that more meditative experience with tea. But then there are other brewing methods that are more focused on the technical aspects or the, getting the perfect brew cup after cup. And that would be more of the Gong Fu style tea, which is Chinese style tea. Um, so bowl tea style is, again, it's, it's a hybrid. It's also relatively new in a way. Like the, this approach to tea is very, very old and tea has been a plant medicine for you know, potentially thousands of years, especially in China and then more recently in Japan, of course. But um, the way that it's served is more or less uh, particular to this tea school that I study with. It's called Global Tea Hut. And it's an attempt to make tea ceremony quite accessible. Like one of the, the downsides of Chen Yu usually is that you would need to be in uh, a tea space for it. You need to be in a Japanese tea room. And there's a very particular way that that tea room would need to be set up. And it's not very easily port portable, <laughs> that, that tea ceremony practice. So what I love about bowl tea is that you know, I can pack up my bowls in a bag and bring them anywhere and bring my kettle and my stove and set up next to a creek or set up at a monastery and, and um, share tea with, with people wherever I go. So as far as the form itself, that's one of the things I love about it. And then the other part of your question, which is, was it how is tea a spiritual practice? That's right. Um, I think, so I can talk about my own experience, knowing, of course, that it's going to be different for each person. But the way that I relate to tea and the way that I, you know, my my, my tea friends and the tea teacher relates to tea within this tradition is that within the within the frame of a tea ceremony, there's so much that we can learn. So tea ceremony as a practice is a practice in mindfulness. It's a practice in slowing down. It's a practice of connecting to oneself, practice of listening. It's a practice of intentional movement and a practice of, of trying to do exactly what you're doing and absolutely nothing else. So if I'm boiling water, I'm just boiling water. I'm far from from this level of <laughs> of skill, but that that's the aspiration. The aspiration is to eventually get to that place where the mind can be so quiet that I can just simply be doing. And with that, with that level of intention, the the tea ceremony becomes a practice space for how I might try to live the rest of my life with that level of intention and presence. There's also a whole other, there are 
you know, many other facets to approaching tea as a spiritual practice. One of them also is hospitality. So within this tradition, and I think most tea traditions actually, especially in Japan and China and Taiwan, um, hospitality is such a huge piece. So creating a really beautiful atmosphere for your guest, stilling your heart before you pour the water for your guest. All of those things are a part of what makes it a practice. And then noticing, like for me, it's a practice of noticing like where, what's preventing me from having a completely open heart in this moment, having a completely open heart to my ceremony, to my guests, to the the loud truck that just drove by, <laughs> whatever it might be. And so, yeah, noticing how I'm showing up in the space is what helps me grow within that practice. Mm -hmm. And then there's a more more sort, sort of mystical element, too, of working with tea as a plant medicine. And we, we specifically work with tea. We work with camellia sinensis. It's, it's, you know, tea is so many things in our culture. It could be chamomile. It could be mint, um, rooibos. But, but within this practice, it is tea from the tea tree. And the reason for that is that we believe that tea has a message. It has its own particular message for us. And the message that I most commonly receive from tea is one around compassion, softening, gentleness. I, I like to think of tea as like the plant form of guanyin. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh. A lot of my practices involve Guan Yin, mm. so it's beautiful to hear that. Um, yeah, I just want to say as well, like, uh, when when I had the privilege of sitting tea ceremony with you, um, usually my mind would start and I would sit down and be sort of in a scattered state and through the ceremony, it would settle and become quiet and calm. And uh, it would be very similar to sitting for say an hour, but uh, in motion and in ceremony. And um, I would also very consistently be moved by the grace that I saw you have in the way that you would adjust the bowls or pour the water or boil the water. Um, I've only really seen that degree of grace and beauty and intention in motion in say um, the monastic setting with, with ceremony there or um, recently doing like say Tai Chi or Qigong or something like that. Uh, and so it was just, and, and that was, it felt like that was being, if I paid attention to you and the way that you moved your body, that that was being transmitted into my body and uh, that I could, Oh, it would inspire me to try to move in that way and in, in my own, certainly in the ceremony itself, but also in my own life. And uh, yeah, those were, those were the most consistent things that I saw in the tea ceremony was like the settling and then also the, the grace in motion. But I, I think there was, there was a sense for sure of uh, other things shifting of like messages being received or uh, shifts happening. But those were very consistent for, to my recollection of what it was like for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess also, yeah, a sense of, of connection uh, to you or anyone that we happen to be sitting for ceremony with, um, like real intimacy, even though it was, is largely silent and uh, just extremely connected and, and present with others and attuned to where they were. And uh, that was always very moving as well. It's just a, a very precious space that you create when you hold a tea ceremony. So thank you for that. How did you, uh, you, you, you mentioned the school that you've trained in. How, how did you um, learn to serve tea so that you could 
offer that to others? I first heard about this particular tea practice when I was at a women's gathering in, at that time it was in Northern California called Spirit, Spirit Weavers Gathering. And mm. every morning there was a tea ceremony available at six o'clock in the, the little tea tent. And um, it was advertised as Chadao, the way of tea or bowl tea. Um, so I actually didn't sit then. I remember trying to get a spot in the tea tent, but the tea tent was always really, it was popular. <laughs> Everyone wanted to have tea. So I heard about the practice and was exposed to the way that it looked and found it to be so beautiful. But I hadn't had the experience of sitting as a guest yet. But at that same women's gathering, I, on the last day, there was this big, beautiful ritual that we all do together. And everyone afterward was like, you're in this field, jumping around and uh, dancing. And the ceremony, like the ceremony of the gathering had just sort of been completed. And I saw this woman and we locked eyes and I, we just felt compelled to give each other a big hug. I didn't know her, but it was a really special hug. And um, she had like long, beautiful brown hair and, and just like energy that I wanted to be around immediately. But we, we, we didn't actually meet. We said, like, I think we ended up hugging other people right after that and then going our separate ways. But, but many months later, I was at a dinner party of a friend in New York, in Manhattan, and I was, we were at this restaurant and I was sitting at this long table with all these people and I look across from me and there's this woman who looks very familiar. And at that time, um, yeah, anyway, I, I was gonna go on a tangent, but I won't go down, but we locked eyes again and, and she said to me, hey, you're the person I gave gave a hug to you at Spirit Weaver's Gathering in the, in the meadow. <laughs> it was just this aha moment and um, immediate friendship. And I think we started like sharing our food between each other and just like oh, kind of, we're, we're tunnel visioned for one another's presence for the rest of the evening. And that's my friend, Catherine. She is a student of the tea school and at that time had already been practicing for a couple of years. And she invited me to her house in, in New York City to come sit as a tea guest. And I did. It was a few weeks after the dinner. I did. And being a guest at her tea ceremony changed my whole life. <laughs> now I know that for sure. But in that moment, I knew it too. Um, the power of sitting with tea in that way just blew me away and it was incredibly emotional and felt moving and even like psychedelic at times as having <laughs> these visuals occur and it was just incredible so I, I I loved Catherine as a person as well and I just wanted to hang out with her as often as possible so I ended up sitting as her guest for a couple of years whenever we hang out and the Global Tea Hut has a magazine and you can become a member and they'll send you the magazine with a little bit of tea every month if you want. So I did that. That was about uh, 2017 that I became a member. And so I started to learn about tea in this different way and was continuing to sit with Catherine as a guest. But I, I felt too intimidated at that time to start a practice of my own. Like I think I, I already, from the first time I sat, felt this is a really serious thing. Being a tea person is a really serious thing. And um, yeah, I think I felt, I felt nervous to, to serve. Part of that too was that the tea center is in Taiwan. And at that time I didn't have the time or the resources to go to Taiwan and train. So I thought like, okay, like I don't even know how I would 
learn to serve tea, I have to be completely reliant on Catherine. And that seems like a lot to ask of her. So, you know, I held off. But then uh, Catherine's teacher, Wuda, came from Taiwan to New York in 2019 and offered some workshops on how to have your own tea practice and how to begin serving. So I was able to meet him and be a student at those workshops and felt then like I had the confidence to begin my own practice. So I started a daily practice in 2019, um, summer solstice. So it's just over two years now that tea has been my daily companion. And, you know, I, so in many ways I've learned just through practice at this point, but also have been able to sit with a lot of other tea practitioners um, of, of many lineages, actually, and learn from them, and continuing to learn from Catherine, learning from Muda remotely, like he's put out some online tea courses that anyone can take and learn how to have their own tea practice within this tradition. So uh, it's very accessible at this point, which I love because my my belief is that tea really wants to work with everybody. She's ready. Mm. She's excited. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Guan Yin. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Lovely. Uh, how have you found that uh, regular daily tea practice has uh related to your, your sitting practice and, and other contemplative practices that you do? Well, I really didn't know much about Zen before tea. Mm. But Buddha of Global Tea Hat is a Zen monk. And he's a Zen monk who, you know, of course, trained in monasteries in Japan, but also had a Chinese or a Malaysian tea teacher who taught him Gong Fu. So Wuda really represents like this coming together of, of those worlds of Zen, but also the, the Chinese relationship to tea, which is of course very old as well. So um, yeah, I didn't know much about Zen, but through reading literature that was put out by Global Tea Hut and then any recommended books that you know, were suggested for my practice, I felt excited by and resonant with what Zen taught because I think mostly because what I was reading just so accurately reflected the experience I had when I was with tea. And... It was like I was getting to experience these things that I couldn't put words to. But then when I would read a book on Zen, like the words were right there. <laughs> and so I quickly realized that, that having a sitting practice, a Zazen practice would be helpful. And, and, and actually within this school, it's uh, like what is quite adamant that if, if, a tea practitioner doesn't also have a meditation practice. They're not really practicing tea. Mm. The two really have to go together. So um, with that, with that uh, strong suggestion, I, I started to take sitting more seriously than I had before. Mm. And, yeah. There's a lot more there that I could say, I think. But mm -hmm. like, especially in terms of what's happened since, like I, in, in sitting Zazen the last couple of years, um, and of course it's contributed to the changes that I've been experiencing in my life and the direction that my life is now feels like it's heading in. And yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, Noticing that I'm pausing because I, there are a couple of different directions that could go in from there. But I'll just, I'll just mm -hmm. talk about that for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that you came to Zazen and Zen through 
tea because uh, I learned about tea relatively late in my own path so, so far. And uh, one of the uh, things that I wish that I had done sooner is incorporate some kind of contemplative movement practice to complement the stillness practice. Um, and I find now that my body and nervous system are really asking to make up for lost time. <laughs> uh, uh, right now, for whatever reason, my body doesn't like doing seated stillness practice very much and prefers to be doing things like standing meditation or um, Tai Chi or Qigong or yoga or things like this or or dancing, my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, it's clear to me from the practice that I've done with you of tea ceremony that um, tea is an excellent way to uh, direct that kind of intention or uh, to complement the stillness practice because it is in motion and it's also really nice because it's, it's very um, practical motions that you might do in daily life of like lifting things or, you know, putting things down or, um, and you can certainly synchronize it with the breath, which is the most important thing that I've found anyway in, in contemplative movement practices to have some kind of connection to the breath. Mm. Um, I, I, has that, has that been your experience as well or anything related to that? Yeah, I I can relate to like the importance that I feel in like including my whole body in my practice through tea. So like, yeah, like lifting, touching, pouring, smelling, tasting, seeing, hearing. Um, Like I, with tea, like we're very involved, <laughs> we're very involved in, in the moment. Um, and if we're not involved, then, you know, that also has its consequences too. And we'll probably find out pretty quickly. I've broken pottery. I've, I've had water boiling out of my kettle, spilling everywhere. I caught my hand on fire before. So tea is, is like not the most forgiving of practices when it comes to a lack of mindfulness. And that's something mm. that I really appreciate about it. Is like you really gotta gotta be showing up your your A game too, mm -hmm. especially when serving other people. And I mean, I love mm -hmm. I love sitting for tea by myself, but serving other people is for me so much more enjoyable. Not just because mm. I get to sit with others, but because it um, it requires like showing up so fully to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts with that as far as breath goes I haven't I mean yeah being mindful of my breathing throughout a tea ceremony is feels essential I notice that when I'm serving other people my breath tends to kind of quicken like I get a little nervous at first and so I really have to bring in focus to my breathing if I'm serving others and the breath is what I also come back to when I'm noticing a desire to like hurry through a ceremony like if I'm pouring tea and um, there's a sense of urgency in me then the guests are going to feel it so I don't want that. So I want to like re return to the breath and slow down, like, breathe before I pick up the kettle, and like use the breath as my guide so that I can show up the way that I want to show up. So, mm -hmm. But I also mm -hmm. feel curious about exploring that even more, and maybe we could talk about that another time. Like hearing about your experience with Tai Chi and how some of the elements of Tai Chi could inform the tea practice. I mean, the, mm -hmm. um, Buddha's teacher's teacher's teacher, I think his name is uh, <laughs> Chang Manqing, he's Chinese, he's a mm. martial arts master, I think they call him a master now, he's passed, he's a master. Mm. 
and he's uh, he's sort of like he was a Renaissance man of sorts, and one of his practices was um, I think it was tai, tai Chi. I believe it was Tai Chi. Another one was was tea. And so, of course, there have been people who are able to cultivate multiple practices that I'm, I'm sure all inform each other. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of multiple <laughs> practices, one, I know one of the sort of avenues that you've explored as well has been um, connection and communication through, say, NVC, a nonviolent communication, and then now uh, circling. And I would love to hear about those things. And um, can you tell me about how you got interested in nonviolent communication and, and what that's been like for you? Yeah. I, I was first exposed to NVC when I was living in Brooklyn. I had moved into a warehouse in Bushwick that had like 12 bedrooms or something. It was um, actually beautiful hand-built bedrooms. And it was one of my favorite living environments I've ever been in. And one of the requests of new residents was to read the book Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And some of the people living there had been practicing in VC for a couple of years And I was really impressed and moved by the way that they were skilled in holding space um, and empathizing. And so I was attracted to the practice pretty quickly. I had this idea that I was a fine communicator because I didn't have much conflict in my life. And as soon as I read the book, I realized I'm really conflict avoidant. (laughs) That's the reason I don't (laughs) have any conflict in my life. So Reading the book gave me some insight into my own patterning and provided some skills to begin to practice in um, engaging with conflict in a way that felt helpful, in in a way that aligned with my values, um, in a way that helped me like say what I meant more effectively. But I, after reading the book, which I read that book in 2012. I tried to practice for a couple of years with some friends and just by myself. And it was so discouraging. It felt, it felt impossible at that time. It was like, I was trying to learn this new language, but no one else really spoke it around me. And so, um, yeah, it felt the the challenge level was really high and and I noticed my practice beginning to kind of dwindle. But then I, some some new energy came through me to sign up for a workshop. And this was in 2014. So I signed up for a workshop in 2014 with the New York Center for Nonviolent Communication. My first workshop that I took with them, which they called the Discovery Weekend, it's like two and a half days of NBC practice for beginners. Um, it, yeah, it blew me away being around people who were really advanced in their practice and speaking with so much compassion, holding a very compassionate worldview in a way that I hadn't really seen before got me really excited about NVC. And and so I I took all the trainings I could with NYC NVC for two and a half, three years. And finally they offered me the opportunity to come help facilitate one of their trainings. And so I, I started to train as a facilitator for these the big workshops. And um, from there, kind of br- started to branch out and do my own teaching as well. So that's the way that it's unfolded. But in terms of what the practice means to me is it's, I mean, Nonviolent communication or compassionate communication, I, I really see as a path, like in the way that I also see tea as a path. Like it's such a full practice. And the thing that really excited me about NBC as a practice was that like when I was would sit in meditation and feel the sense of connectedness, unity, like 
it's love. Yeah, oneness with, with the world. It felt so good. And then I would come out of my meditation and try to like, I'd like call my family. And suddenly like that experience just like, poof, like vanished and I was back in my habitual ways of relating. And I didn't know how to bridge the two. I didn't know how to bring that sense of love and care and compassion into the way that I um, was in relationship to others. And so that the practice of NBC was the first bridge that I encountered in that way. And I feel the same way about it today. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tool set, but I also see it as a way of life. Like it's, it teaches compassion as a way of life. And I'm grateful that I, <clears throat> that I found NYC NVC because the way that my teacher Tom teaches this practice is the way that I really respect. It's like he emphasizes that the practice needs to come from within like, the, the curiosity, the openness, the compassion, the intention has to be felt first before the words are spoken. And I think that's something that can get missed in NBC communities and in the way NBC can be taught. Like there can be a heavy reliance on the words themselves to do the work for us, but it usually doesn't work because if I'm saying something and I'm feeling angry, no matter what words I use, that anger or that blame <laughs> will probably be felt. And so the way that he teaches, which is the way that I also teach now is that this practice, like, I mean, 99% of it happens inside. And then the words are there to carry the energy of the intention that's already been cultivated. And mm -hmm. of course there, there's more to the practice than that as well, but, but having that be the, the focus of, of NBC for me has been really helpful. Mm. Mm. It reminds me of, um, I, I've, I've reflected quite a bit on the concept of right speech in Buddhism, and it's uh, two of the five factors of right speech from a Buddhist perspective are kind words, that your words are kind, but also um, that the state of mind that you're in as you speak the words is kind and um, it'd be easy to have one without the other. Uh, certainly that makes a lot of sense of what I've seen from NVC of like, there's these wonderful sort of templates for phrases or words that you can use or patterns for how a conversation might occur. But if you just say the words without <laughs> the right state of mind, uh, the right intention, the right clarity, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense that that would still be felt and that the conversation would still be uh, like detrimental interpersonally. Um, I'd be curious to ask, um, I think the thing I'm most curious about with this is, you know, you started doing circling training uh, with Circling Europe in the last months. And um, that's after being introduced to circling at Maple. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm really curious about that, about how that's been going for you and what circling is like for you and how that relates to or connects to or diverges from your experience of NVC, because they're both they're both getting at how to communicate and relate to other people, but they're sort of different feels or intentions or methods. And I, I'm, I imagine that that's been an interesting journey for you. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, taking this facilita facilitator training with Circle of Europe for me has been like pretty brutal in the most wonderful way. <laughs> I, I love it. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I can talk about what initially excited me about circling. So, like I came into Maple last year with, like having at that point practice, been practicing NVC for eight years, um, but you know, with with a lot of intention and focus for six years, like 2014 to 2020 at that point. Um, and 
I was amazed that like like in MVC we think of it as like a really long it's kind of a long term path. It's it's something that you it's really hard to learn overnight. Like these skills take some time to develop and the brain takes time to rewire. Um so I was kind of in shock when I got to the monastic academy and I was sitting at the lunch table and the people next to me started talking in a way that had so much ownership, so much vulnerability, so much self-awareness. Um, like, it, it was surprising. And, and like, some of these people had been there only a few weeks. <laughs> like, what is, what's in the water here? How are these, like, you know, young monastics, arguably young monastics, um, so skilled in communication? Like, the things that they're... the, the the techniques that they're using in this conversation that I'm overhearing are techniques that take years to learn sometimes in the way that I have been approaching NBC. So I was really impressed. I was really curious. Um, I was told about circling and how circling is part of the culture at Maple and other weekly circling workshops. And one of the residents offered to, like, post a little impromptu circle that day for me to experience what circling was. Um, so, yeah, I, I immediately just felt excited that circling focused on owning one's experience, um, but didn't also have a lot of other, there weren't a lot of other rules. So it's, it's, a practice that can be learned quite quickly. So I love that. And there was a lot of overlap between NBC and circling in that sense. Like NBC really focuses on owning the one's experience and so does circling. So I, I was able to drop into the practice of circling pretty quickly. But um, what I found was that, you know, in coming into a path of NVC for myself, something kind of tricky happened. Like a lot of beautiful things happened, a lot of incredible growth, but something tricky happened too, which was that like I was coming in with a kind of people pleaser personality. And something that NVC teaches is like, if you, if you get really in, into NVC, you develop the skills to communicate in this very ideal sort of way. Like I'm, I'm gonna completely own my experience all the time. I'm gonna speak objectively about what's happening. I'm not gonna speak to blame or anger or judgment. I'm gonna take responsibility for the way the conversation's gonna go. Like it's very artful in that sense. Um, and it's great if you're a people pleaser who wants to be a perfect communicator <laughs> because the tools are right there. So uh, <laughs> what I realized pretty quickly into my circling journey was that I was really scared of the more messy part of myself and had, hadn't created a lot of space to let that part out and let it be loved. So, um, one of, so it, it revealed to me that there was this, this whole part of my communication practice as a whole that was kind of missing, which was um, speaking, the, speaking the scary thing in the moment in a way that was imperfect, learning to be with the impact of it, the consequence of it, and still love myself and the other person no matter what happened. And also still see the humanity of myself and the other person, no matter what happened. Um, mm. And I think this was because I, I was blind to that, blind to that part of me as an NVC student as well. Like there are other NVC practitioners out there who are amazing at like being with their mess. But for me, it was something that I just kind of kept tucked away. So in circling, um, I realized like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to explore that. To me, for me to explore 
speaking to what's here in this present moment, saying the scary thing that I think I shouldn't say, and also, yeah, learning to get more comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So I don't know if that's, if that's a clear explanation of what excites me about circling. It's, it's been honestly kind of difficult to describe because circling is so experiential and it's so different depending on who you're circling with and what's present between you two and what's present, what we're bringing to a circle. But in general, that's been my big work. My big work has been to get a little more messy, to embarrass myself, <laughs> mm. to, uh, again, like, learn, learn to be more comfortable with my own anxieties, my own fears, and learn to more effectively hold space when those fears and anxieties are present for other people. Something that can happen within an MBC practice is that like there's such focus on um, communicating in a way that that is where there, there's like the least amount of harm done possible. Hmm. That like often when things get really hot, really edgy, within an NVC practice, the most skillful thing that you could probably do is take a little space and like let yourself cool down and connect to what's really happening for you and then be able to reapproach the conversation in a way that you know you want to. And I became really good at that. But <laughs> the piece that was missing was like, how to be in the fire? Like, how can I be yeah. in the fire? And, and what often happens for me when I'm in the fire is that I shut down. I shut down, I freeze. I dissociate. So in signing up for this facilitator training, I'm putting myself in situations where I'm trying to get frozen and dissociated and shut down to learn how it is for me. So, <laughs> so I'm serious, uh -huh. I'm brutal. That's what I mean. <laughs> wow. 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 I really admire the courage behind that uh, and relate to it a lot. Um, you know, both from circling experience and just life in general of really avoiding conflict and then and then also seeing the benefit that comes when you lean into it and uh, speak the truth that you have even when it's messy or uncomfortable and um, so I'm, I'm really glad that you're doing that and I think the two are you know I, I've done less with NVC but I think that the two are a really excellent complement to each other and it's, it's fascinating to hear from you about how they're they're relating and, and almost maybe uh, to go out on a limb a little bit about to, to hear like sort of the shadow sides of each of them like uh, mm. that it was easy for you to avoid conflict with NVC and then you know similarly uh, <laughs> circling has its own challenges at least from what I've seen of it it can get you know maybe too messy so um, in, a, in, a, in multiple dimensions uh, but you know there's real real beauty in, in both of those practices as well so it's it's fascinating to hear about how you've combined them yeah i'm i'm working to i'm working to for myself mm -hmm. and i don't know how that i'm sure it will eventually impact the way that i teach nbc or if i start teaching circling of course nbc will be woven into that you know, just mm -hmm. naturally because it's it's so much a part of I guess the way that I relate to the world by now, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like, I mean, I just geek out about it so much. I could talk about NBC and circling for hours and the, the parts that overlap, the parts that are really different. And it's been a really fun exploration for me. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. What's, what's, what overlaps and what doesn't, and what are you finding with that? Well, I think about like what the focus is of either one. Like with NBC, the focus is really on uh, compassion. Like everything we do, we do to meet 
a need of ours. All humans share the same basic universal needs. Everyone's needs matter. I can recognize that when someone does something that that I don't like, um, you know, I can judge them for it and just stay with my judgment and that could be the end of it. Or I can get curious as to why they might have done that thing and what need they were trying to meet and what they were feeling when they did and said the thing that bothered me and also connect to more deeply to what was happening for me there. Um, and then through that, like, we, yeah, we can have more compassion in our relationships and compassion for people in the world who are doing all kinds of things that we might find triggering or confusing and, and relate to that, uh, relate to that re- relatable part of them that's underneath their behavior. With circling, you know, compassion is not the focus of circling. I think it's it's one of one of like the magical results sometimes of some circles is that you might feel more compassion for the other person and understanding of them, especially in a birthday circle when the focus is on one person and their experience of life in that moment. But it seems to be in general like with circling and and I'm such a newbie still, so I mean I it's 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 difficult for me to put words to what circling is. Um, but the way that I understand it or relate to it is that it's it's a lot about discovery. It's like okay, what is What's happening for me right now? What are the subtleties of my experience? What what kind of energy is moving through my body? How is it now? How is it now? How is it now? And in that way, I I can really see it as an interpersonal meditation. Um, And then, so like the self-connection piece feels similar to NBC in that way, but then the, the differences come in in what's shared. So there are less um, guidelines around what's shared when it comes to circling, but th- th- there is a similar guideline of owning one's experience. And NBC takes that to the most essential possible degree where it's like, I'm actually not going to, I'm, I'm going to like relinquish my story altogether and just focus on the feeling and need present. With circling, story might be woven in, too. So with that, um, yeah, with that, it's it's a it's it can be a different practice, and and actually, not not trying to focus on like reducing harmful impact, but instead just being with the impact and being curious about that too seems to be a helpful thing that circling focuses on. And that excites me. It excites me because with circling, there's so much life coming through because we're not trying to be really specific about our word choice. And of course, that has wonderful results sometimes. Sometimes, as you said, can be messy when there's like just so much energy, emotion, passion coming through. But for where I'm at in my own practice, as I, as I said, that's feeling really helpful. It's feeling really helpful to just kind of remove the filters and as much as I can so that I can honestly be with what's here and even, you know, speak to what's here. Mm-hmm. 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 I, I'm also, I got this sense. Well, go ahead. Oh, please. I was going to say, please. I'm also curious, like, I love hearing what other people think circling is and the way they relate to it too. And that I always learn. Like, I think you, you actually said something to me once about circling that really stuck with me, like in the practice of surrendered leadership, like, you know, more organic circling. Um, I always thought of it as sort of like leaderless, 
like we're here, there's no leader, we're going to just see what happens. And then you framed it for me in a way that was like, you could also see it as anyone can be a leader in that space. Anyone can step into that role. And that is, from my experience now, that is what happens, is that someone will step in and kind of take a risk and say like, I want all of us to focus on this particular person right now. Let's do it. And then maybe people do, maybe they don't, but um, yeah, like directing the flow of attention is is a practice within circling for sure. And hmm. it's been helpful to see it that way. It's interesting that you speak about it that way because it's very possible I said it that way, but my own sense of it has been that everyone can be a leader and ideally in that setting everyone does try to step into their own leadership through the whole time um and so i would really i would try to always be a leader in surrendered leadership and then expect that others would as well and hope and not not everyone does step into that or the way that they do looks wildly different but um i would always be like planting my feet in the ground for the thing that I saw or um, moving towards what I wanted or um, trying to keep in mind my sense of the whole, not just myself, but the whole in the way that, you know, basically holding myself to my own standards of what leadership means. But in that context, of course, whatever, not only that it's a surrendered leadership circle, but also the very particular moment or circumstance of the given circle. And, um, and really that that's, uh, as with a lot of practices that there's no boundary between that and life of, uh, why not just always be a leader and speak for what you see and hold yourself to your highest values and look for the benefit of the whole and, and all of that, uh, that it's, it's like a training ground for that, but ideally you hold that through the whole surrendered leadership circle and, through your whole life. And, uh, you know, no one ever explained it to me that way, but uh, that's how I came to see it myself um, in a way that was helpful. Because otherwise it's just anarchy of like, no one's a leader, <laughs> you know, this is just a mess. But if you take ownership, then that allows and empowers others to take ownership. And then uh, certainly the most difficult circles I had were surrendered leadership circles and the most empowering, beautiful life-changing ones that I had were surrendered leadership circles. And that's, that's like, you have to put your money on the table to like <laughs> make it move in a direction where it can be that powerful. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I love seeing it that way. I, um, it's interesting for me to think about like what each person is bringing to the room when we're in a surrender leadership circle. And something that's become clear in this training that I'm in now is that, um, and this is something I love about it, is that I think by now most people have a sense of like what their individual work is and mm -hmm. in what ways they're looking to grow. And so all of that ends up in the circle at some point. You know, like we're, we're all kind of in our, it seems like we're all in our experience of um, testing the edge, testing our own edges, taking risks in that way, getting burned, learning. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as a result, it, it really does seem like anarchy <laughs> because if you're coming in with something totally different. Um, but there's, for me, there's actually like a perfection in that too. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I guess because of the, the work that I'm bringing into the circle, I haven't, I haven't related to surrendered surrender leadership in the way that you're describing yet. Like, yeah, I haven't, um, like I haven't been able to trust when I'm wanting to come into the circle with that kind of equanimity or, or care or intention. Like, because I'm trying to break down my own barriers, break down my caretaker, break down my people pleaser. 
but I would love to get mm-hmm. to the point where I can like show up in a circle with intention and really be able to trust where that intention is coming from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's also a practice. So like you could do it for like two minutes and see how it goes and then <laughs> and be like, Oh, that didn't work. Oh no. Or, Oh, that went didn't go so poorly. It was fine. Um, I mean, I know I had to like take risks and try things and, fall on my face a billion times and you know not like I've figured it out I haven't circled in in months now but um although in a way these conversations actually have really been a different form of a similar training of uh you know attuning to people and tending to the conversation and and that kind of thing um yeah yeah uh, a continued form of training along along the same direction with a really different shape and and setting, of course, but um, same kinds of elements of connection and intimacy and, uh, and and paying attention to people and my own experience and things like that uh, all play in. Um, yeah. Which is actually interesting. I, one of the senses I got when you were speaking is, of, you know, these two different methodologies that you've exposed yourself to are, this is probably an oversimplification, but that you could look at it you know, in, in Maple's terms of like awakening and responsibility or, uh, you know, truth seeking versus like healing, compassion, connection kind of thing of um, like circling, you can see as being about like, what is the truth here? What is present now? Or uh, that kind of angle of just what is here? And we, we might not like it, but here we go. And uh, NVC being about like, how do we skillfully connect other people in a way that's beneficial, not harmful, that kind of thing. And more focus on like the, uh, it sounds like anyway, the, the, the outcomes and the, the safety of the experience and that kind of thing. Um, would, does that resonate with you and your experience or does that seem to miss anything or? Yeah. Yeah. That resonates for me. I'm, um, it's, it's an ongoing exploration. Yeah, I hmm. something that's coming to mind right now is like this question I have around the presence of care, the role of care in both practices. Yeah, it's it's something that in NVC is, is just so much of the focus. And in circling, I think, is naturally something that can come through, but isn't necessarily a focus. And when I think about the relationship between the two, that's one of the questions I have is... What's the role of care in circling? In what ways is it helpful? In what ways is it harmful? In what ways is it a coping mechanism? Yeah, sorry. When you were speaking, my my mind just like jumped somewhere else. So I want to bring it back to (laughs) your question. Um, It strikes me as somewhat... uh overly simplistic like uh but 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 a useful simplification to look at circling and nbc in that relationship of um you know awakening and responsibility or or uh truth seeking and and uh care for connection or something like that um you know circling as a kind of interpersonal meditation versus nbc as a structure for supporting difficult conversations going skillfully that kind of thing uh it seems it seems overly simplistic to me but also like a useful simplification yeah yeah i guess also like i don't i just have more to learn about like what those like you said it's it could be an oversimplification but i i guess i have curiosity within myself around like what responsibility means in that context 
like if mm -hmm. if I'm just thinking about it kind of intuitively, I think like responsibility and care are completely like one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I think like NVC's focus is. Like how can I have my actions be and my words be very mindful, be very intentional. What would that work look like? And then what I what I love about circling too is that it's um, it the, the same maybe in, intentionality is there, but in a totally different form. Like what I see as being like the care and responsibility of circling is getting to know ourselves on a much deeper level. Like getting to know ourselves in the rawness, in the mess. And for that like with that, like care to me is woven in because if I can know myself deeper, then I can know my patterning deeper. I can know what I'm bringing into my relationships. I can know what I'm bringing into my practice. And there's this incredible level of awareness that can result from um, like an un, un, an unbound um, exploration around communication. So, yeah. I think, you know, part of my explanation is coming from um, some some ignorance around what responsibility in the way that you're talking about it means. But I guess, these, yeah, these are just my initial thoughts. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because I think one of the elements that I found missing from circling that Maple has tried to add, I don't know how that's going for them, but that I certainly took up for myself while I was there and have taken up since leaving is holding myself to a standard of Buddhist right speech, noble speech. And uh, that. Um, that that's like an artificial constraint to add to circling and limits what's possible, but make sure that to the best that you can, I mean, it's an ongoing practice of like, what is right speech and what is the skillful thing to say here? And, and sometimes it's not expected that like I've found myself surprised by what seems to be right speech. It's, uh, not what I expected necessarily, um, but it does constrain things and, but that constraint frees things so that um, my, my experience of it was that circling felt a lot cleaner when I held myself to that standard of, I'm not gonna um, have essentially like negative karmic impacts on myself or others if I hold myself to that standard. And, you know, it, it's, it's, as I say, it's a process and I, I, I don't, I don't think I've like perfected right speech, but keeping that in mind of like what the, the factors of it are um, has been really helpful in circling and, and also in, in general in speech, um, you know, I've talked a lot elsewhere about how it's been useful to me online on social media, where a lot of people do have difficulty speaking skillfully and trying at least to, uh, hold myself to the standard of right speech has made my experience a lot smoother, even as I talk about very difficult topics to speak about skillfully. Um, so I, I don't know. That's, that's one thing that I see as a possible bridge or um, addition to one or the other of circling or uh, NVC that, you know, not everyone's going to want to add, but um, you don't need to be a Buddhist to add that either. The The factors are, things that if you look at them make sense, even if you're not a Buddhist, it's like, well, first off, everyone in our culture already cares about truth and accuracy. Mo most people in our culture care about truth and accuracy of speech. That's that's something you can kind of take as a given, right? That people don't like if you lie to them or something, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then there's, um, we already talked about kind words and kind state of mind. And then there's also like that something you're saying is beneficial and useful, not harmful or negative or um, detracting from a conversation or, or idle, that it's not just like useless. Um, and then that it's also timely that you're saying it at the right time in the right context 
in the right way at the right venue, the right tone of voice and all of that. Um, and uh, like that, that's a very high standard, but it's the more I've like reflected on what those words mean and tried to adhere my verbal and written speech to that and body language <laughs> to that standard, um, things go better. And I think circling is almost like very, very risky. It's a risky endeavor to do circling. It's extremely powerful and potent and I've had huge transformations from it and green gain great benefit. But I think it's like, from my perspective, like karmically risky, mm-hmm. uh, you know, put it more simply, like you can hurt yourself or other people if you speak or act in ways that are harmful. And, um, you know, you don't need to import a sense of karma to have that, but just that like your actions have consequences that could be negative for yourself or others. Uh, and holding yourself, holding myself to that standard has helped me to feel like I've got like a seatbelt for, mm-hmm. for, for, for that kind of situation. Yeah. 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 I'm curious to hear more about what you shared like, with circling, um, Circling helping like connect you to your integrity when it comes to right speech. Like, would you say that it's mostly about owning your experience, regardless of what's happening? Is like, is that where you found the benefit to be? Is it like the honesty or immediacy of circling? Because I can totally agree that um, like there can be harm done with circling. It is a risky practice mm-hmm. in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think circling opened me up to a number of dimensions of experience and interaction and speech and communication and relationship that I previously was not aware of or was aware of to a limited degree and also so i became aware of those things and could attune to them um but also was given a set of what i would say are like basically tools for interaction like things like um you know i noticed that you're paying attention to me right now or you know it seems like you're paying attention to me right now or i noticed that you're not speaking right now or I imagine that you're interested in what I'm saying, or, um, you know, I feel this while we're speaking or, um, you know, asking a question or making a request. Um, those are all sort of like moves that I learned through circling. Um, and there are others as well. And um, so it gave me both an awareness of different aspects of experience and connection that I wasn't aware of, and then ways to interact with those dimensions but not so many uh, guidelines about how to do that skillfully there are certain basic principles and they try to teach those to you not very well i think <laughs> uh i don't know i maybe i'm too critical but it took me a while to kind of figure out just what they literally meant or how to do it but also um, i did learn from people's example you know having a lot of wonderful people to circle with and being like they're doing something there what what is that uh, and trying to emulate them, um, but specifically, sort of importing the the concept of right speech into my practice of circling, shifted it so that I felt like I had that safety belt that I didn't have before. Of like, because I, I don't know I had many many circles where I walked away feeling like not so good in my body. And it seemed like other people were not feeling so good in my body, in their bodies, and that that was a result of the way that I had shown up or carried myself. And uh, that doesn't feel good. (laughs) I don't want to have that effect. And um, the more I steered towards adding right speech to noticing these things and using these skills, it felt like, oh, this is this is going better. Uh, I'm not walking away feeling miserable in my body or feeling like I've hurt someone else. It's, you know, um, I'm probably overly simplifying it. Um, you know, like how the kinds of problems that I faced or or the challenges that I had learning circling, but, but I, I do think it's, um, 
both extremely powerful. It's extremely powerful, right? <laughs> like it has great benefits and I've benefited from it tremendously. And that power can come at a cost of, you know, having significant impacts on yourself and other people. Yeah. So it sounds like it, it gave you some initial confidence to do things like make requests or speak to your present experience in ways that maybe you weren't taught to as a child growing up. Um, but then when it came to like honing the craft or working with these tools in a way that actually felt good to you, bringing in the uh, approach of right speech um, is what ended up making it feel a lot better as a practice. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I found that that I, I needed to start practicing that for it to be more beneficial to, for me and safer for me and for others. And um, it, I found the same thing elsewhere. I mean, you know, I, I said this already, but a lot of people talk about social media as this like terrible thing that it just, you know, like Twitter, for example, which I'm on a lot as like a rage machine and outrage machine and whatever. And I, I just like genuinely do not experience it that way now because of the way that I conduct myself there and the standard that I hold myself to. And it's actually, it's actually like the opposite of what people talk about because it's, it's like an extremely intimate connecting, like healing, lovely, loving scene that I find myself in because of the way that I show up and, and the people that I connect with and that kind of thing. And uh, right speech for me is, is like the foundation of that, of I'm going to hold myself to this standard and, you know, I, I make mistakes and it's not perfect and stuff, but like, that's, that's my goal. And then that shifts into um, an extremely positive experience in a setting where a lot of people have difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been on your Twitter and I was like, oh, I could hang out here for a while. It's just, the uh -huh. vibes are good. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I do hang out there quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's felt. It's felt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Well, I'd be curious to ask you, there's there's one other thing I'd really like to get to, which is um, to, to hear a little bit about your your coaching work and uh, in particular around money, this project Wingmakers that you alluded to. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is and the kinds of services that you offer to people and and so on? Yeah. Um, so I last year started working with just friends and family to start one-on-one um, -on -one in a casual way, helping people with their financial anxiety and all the different forms that that can take, whether it's like a fear of spending money, um, overspending, over shopping, um, scarcity mentality, avoidance. And all of the help that I could give was based on my own very fraught relationship to money that I've had much of my life and have had to work through. So when the pandemic hit last year, I, I was reflecting on how far I had come and how painful the years were for me when I felt really out of control with my finances and particularly with my relationship to spending where it was... Um, such a comfort strategy for me to shop, to like accumulate things that I thought were beautiful, kind of kind of fill this unfillable void within myself of wanting, wanting, yeah, comfort, security, uh, safety, and I mean, I really can give credit to my tea and my sitting practice for helping with that change and recognizing that those things were not the solution. And actually that I had, um, by like not being aware in that relationship to money, that I had made life a lot harder for myself. So pulling myself out of that hole took a little while. The work started when I was in my mid-20s and um, 
for the next couple of years, there were kind of some like rock bottom moments, like multiple, <laughs> like I was like hit the bottom and then like skipped on the bottom <laughs> a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally what we like woke up to the behavior and decided to change it. But the, the process took a really long time. I felt so alone, so shamed. Uh, the idea of talking to other people about it felt unbearable, impossible. Like my level of shame was so high that I kept most of that a secret. And for that reason, I think it took a lot longer than it might have if I had someone to help me through and to like love me and cheer me on, even for the tiniest victories. So yeah, when the pandemic hit last year and there was so much financial anxiety in my community and in the world, so many people lost their jobs. Businesses I knew and loved were closing. Finances became the focal point I know of my life and then of the life of many of my loved ones. So um, I offered to do some coaching to some people very close to me and loved it and set up a little program where it was, at first it was an eight week program and there were assignments and journaling prompts and meditations and, um, and then very practical practical teachings as well around how to have a budget what what the budget is for how like how and where to save money how and where to invest money um, all things that I had just kind of taught myself and yeah through these little trial programs I ended up loving it so much and decided that it was something that I wanted to do and more regular regularly and offer to more people so I started what is now called Wingmakers, and that's my little business. Um, so I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, and the program is now 12 weeks long. And it's not eight weeks. And it's still the same approach. It's approaching money not just through, um, through like a practical lens, but also through an emotional lens, a spiritual lens looking at our relationship to our desires, looking at our relationship to our things, and looking at our relationship to our sense of worth is often a big part of money work. So it ends up being, I guess the approach could be like, it ends up being a, a holistic approach to money in that sense that when we look at money, what often happens is that like, everything is there. <laughs> if, the light, if the light is shining on the money relationship, it's probably also shining on the relationship to family, our, our sense of purpose in the world. Again, like our aspirations, our goals, our desires, and the work can go really deep. So I, I don't think I would be able to offer wingmakers without having a nonviolent communication practice. And also at this point, um, circling has been extremely helpful in, in my wingmakers work. Um, but also having a mindfulness practice too. And, and um, all of that gets woven in to the program. So I'm particularly interested in working with people who have a fraught relationship to spending because that's been such a big part of my path healing that and it really excites me like I, I'm, I'm really into um, like conscious relationship to my things like I'm a big Marie Kondo fan um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a minimalist but I, I think I have like the approach to space that a minimalist would and thinking like, I only want things in my house that I really love and care about. And so all of that gets woven into like relationship to shopping and what do we really need? What's the difference between a want and a need? How do we navigate that? And um, how do we remember and recognize that 
the thing that we're looking for actually doesn't exist outside of us. Hmm. Yeah, it's been really fun. If someone go ahead. If, if someone wanted to work with you uh, on this, like, what does that look like? It's a it's a twelve week program, like, uh, and you work one on one. Uh, how often do you run these programs, and and what does that look like? Um, right now, registration is is just kind of like open to anybody. I I don't start at a particular time. I don't start all my clients at a particular time. It's just kind of uh, as they roll in, we begin. And the way that it's structured is we would have a, a like thirty minute intro call to just make sure we're a good fit to work together. Um, there are some people that. I wouldn't be a good fit for. And there are some people that I'd be a really good fit for. So we, we just try to get a sense of, um, yeah, how, how we would work together. And if it's a, if it's a go, then we would pick a time to meet every week for 12 weeks. And the meetings would happen over Zoom. And they're one hour long. And then there's homework in between each week. So the, program is kind of it's set up in in, like loosely in modules like the first four weeks are usually looking at the history childhood relationship to money the familial relationship to money spending patterns dating back to as far as we can remember like usually the patterns that we see that are harmful in our lives now were present when we were like seven years old in some way Mm. carry them for that long so we look at that and it's usually more of an emotional deep dive those first few weeks. I also like to encourage people to set up money altars, to have a physical representation of what it is that they're looking to cultivate in their lives, a mm. place to, to pray if they want to pray for healthy mm. money relationship. And then the next four weeks are more practical. So we leave in budgeting tools. Um, we look at where money is being held, where Income can come in if, if someone needs to bring in more income. Um, we do often do like a, a no buy challenge where I encourage my clients not to spend any money on non-essentials for a week or two and to get to know their spending patterns in that way. And that can be really fun. I mean, it's fun fun for me. It's usually mm. painful for them for the first week at least. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and yeah, just begin to kind of re-pattern. And then the last four weeks are usually mm. integration. So noticing what else is there to work with, like how how to have the practice be sustainable in the long term. And yeah, see what what's coming up at the end. Like what which patterns that feel limiting are are more stubborn than others. And, and we, yeah, we look at how what long term care could look like for each person. And then I do, like, I have graduate calls every month, too. So anyone who's been through the program can come and join a call and talk about what's happening in their money world and be in an environment where um, it's okay to talk about money. Hmm. Because it's so, Hmm. I think for me, it's been so rare to find places in my life where I'm encouraged to talk about my finances. Like, I'm not from a family that talked about money that much. My friend group doesn't talk about money that much in like in an open way like it would be for many of us I think it'd be really strange to ask like how much money do you have in your bank account right now Mm -hmm. it's like considered an Mm -hmm. extremely personal question and Mm -hmm. to me that's Mm -hmm. just it's interesting it's fascinating Mm -hmm. it's such a taboo it's like more taboo than talking about Mm -hmm. someone's sex life in many ways totally totally so yeah one of the intentions Uh, is to create a really safe space for people to talk about Funny and, and uh, judgment free, very compassionate, very loving environment for that. Mm. 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 That sounds like such a wonderful and empowering, helpful program for people. Thanks. Yeah. It feels truly like nourishing for me to 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 have this be my work right now. I mean, as someone mm-hmm. who's also like, I'm going to be on a lifelong money path myself. Like, I don't. There are always new challenges coming in to work with. So. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. So, 
we've covered a lot of territory. <laughs> Is there anything that you feel like you want to share or say or ask or reveal or anything at all that feels like it would be uh, worth speaking about or sharing at this time? I can't think of anything else that I would want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I, I would be curious if you are interested to close our session with a little circling. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Great. How are you feeling now having uh, been in this conversation for nearly two hours? <laughs> I feel like a little jittery in my body. Hmm. There's a there's this like a spa like a spaciousness and like and almost like also like a sharpness in there too. Like the sharpness might be something like how did it go? How is this for passion? Did I did I make sense when I was speaking? Yeah, some a little like insecurity around that. Mm. Is this going mm. to be interesting for anyone to listen to? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, well, you did great. I I love the conversation. So there's that. At least uh, one person has. And yeah, you made sense. Uh, for myself, I mostly notice uh, a fair bit of like, n not extreme, but physical discomfort, just like from sitting still and uh, yeah, like fatigue, but on an emotional level, mostly like enjoyment and connection and uh, like gratitude for this time and uh, appreciation for the things that we've talked about. I feel like it's been a really rewarding conversation at least for me and i imagine others will will find it enjoyable as well and um maybe even a little bit uh spicy i don't know i think it got a little spicy when we were talking about circling like i could see people disagreeing or having contentions about the things that we talked about or at least that i shared and that's 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 almost um it would be a little scary, but it's mostly amusing and kind of exciting right now. It's like oof, spicy, <laughs> a little, a little spicy, just a little spicy. <laughs> yeah. 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 I feel, I feel excited hearing that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just like thinking, like kind of going back into story right now, but just thinking about how much I appreciate that. In circling communities that I, at least I've been exposed to, there aren't a lot of shoulds around how circling is talked about. And so it seems like a welcome, a welcoming community when it comes to things like criticism or questions or reflections on what's working, what's not working. Yeah, I'm, I also am still, I'm like noticing that in my body right now, there is some, a little nervousness in how, how like subjective my own experience is in coming from like this background of NBC and coming into circling, like what's feeling valuable to me about like, uh, I wouldn't say departing from my NBC practice for a time, but bringing in something raw and <laughs> that like raw thing is, is circling. And um, I think I feel the nervousness because I don't, like there seems to be like a, an either or thing that can happen in talking about these practices, like which one's better NBC or circling or like, I've been in circling spaces that like kind of look down on NBC as being like lifeless or um, constricting in certain ways. And I found myself too getting into that same trap of like comparing the two practices and mm. Mm. that doesn't feel helpful necessarily. Mm -hmm. 
but I also like I'm so grateful to be to have had this NBC experience to be leaving and circling now but I don't know that that same trajectory would work for everyone else and I even have friends who are interested in circling but who haven't studied NBC much um or friends who are really interested in NBC who haven't had any experience circling and it's hard for me to recommend like what would be best for them at that time and I think it's just totally depends on what each individual's work is so I um I think I was I feel nervous about like any sort of suggestion or like recommendation that might have come mm-hmm. through my language in talking about my own mm. path mm. yeah I didn't hear anything like that uh uh the the metaphor that comes to mind to me is like and I think this is similar for contemplative practice as well, but it's like of of movement practices where there's just like a lot of ways to move your body and different people are going to be called to different things or, you know, you could go to one form and then, you know, like I, I can do Tai Chi and one day and then do go to the gym the next or something like that. And uh, one's not better than the other or something. They're just different and um, complementary even. And um, yeah, on a similar level, I feel um, maybe obliged to clarify that uh, this is something that often comes up when I talk about right speech, but like for me, right speech isn't about um, policing other people's speech. It's about uh, a voluntary practice that you take up for yourself of holding yourself to a certain standard and exploring what that standard actually means. So I wouldn't want for it to be something that um, was imposed on people, but that people were like, oh, that sounds really useful. I want to take that up for myself and try that out and see what that would look like uh, rather than I think it could go extremely poorly if it was like externally imposed and that would be uh, sort of fascist or something. <laughs> so I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like if you're calling someone out saying you're engaging in wrong speech, are you in that moment also engaging in wrong speech? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think that there's actually like an interesting, like it's better not to do that, but in a, in a situation where um, like say you and I are in a Sangha or we're in connection on a spiritual level where like there are venues or times like timely speech where that could be the right thing to say, to be like, I think that actually wasn't very skillful of you to say for these reasons. And and this is how it seemed to me, but that's, that's a really heavy move. And for that to go well, I think it requires a lot of, intimacy and shared context. So I typically only say that to say like someone that I feel like I am in Sangha with and um, that they, that we have enough shared trust and relationship where I have the, the, the space to say something like that and it will be received well. And typically I say it privately, not publicly because no one, you know, that's not going to go well. And, but it's, it's a very, it's very rare that I would say something like that. Um, I think I've, said that like two or three times to people ever and it's always I always try to do it in a place where there is that shared context and trust and intimacy where that would be appropriate and and generally it's just not appropriate to to speak about someone else's speech uh, more of something that you hold yourself to yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah that's helpful to think about it sounds like the times when it's felt beneficial to give people feedback is when you know that their goals are similar to yours and that they would appreciate hearing that feedback, even if it's not in that moment, like on a deeper level, they would probably appreciate it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, um, and then the response is something of like gratitude and appreciation. They're like, Oh, thank you so much for that. Cause it does, it does align with where they're trying to go. And, and certainly I've appreciated that feedback when people have been kind enough to give it to me and it's helped me, to move forward. So it's just, it's just very, it's very intimate and vulnerable and not, um, not something you can just enforce uh, as like a law or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'm glad we clarified these things because they're, um, you know, adding some nuance to the texture of it. So um well, I'm so glad we could talk today, Lindsay. I, I so appreciate your time and, and we covered so much valuable and important territory and I really enjoyed it and I suspect others will as well. So thank you so much for your time and for speaking with me. 
thank you, Tasha, and so much. It's been a pleasure. Mm. And I'll mm. talk to you soon. Mm.